about six months ago, back in, well, actually longer, back in March, um, I, let's get this, um, that's right, working, good. Um, I had that feeling, you know, everybody's got a book in them. Well, I didn't really have much fiction in me, but I had, felt I had something like a, a thesis or a, a report in me. And I volunteered to do something for the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism to answer this question, does open data need journalism? Nice closed question, should take about 10 minutes. The answer is yes, let's move on and go to lunch. Um, of course, it's much more complicated than that. Um, I wanted to look at the impact that journalism is having on open data and open data is having on journalism. Um, and rather sort of contrary to Becky in looking for her six case studies of, um, of, of impact, uh, it's really difficult to find the impact uh, of open data on journalism. If you go back to why um, people like the uh, Americans, in this case data.gov, but many, many open government data portals have something about why they're there, what they're doing. Um, you could, we could be interactive, and you put your hand up if any of these are the area you think that you are working with open data for. But the, the Americans and many others say things like cost savings, anybody? Efficiency, fuel for business, improved civic services, informed policy, performance planning, research, scientific discoveries, Transparency and accountability, heading into journalistic territory. Increased public participation in the democratic dialogue. And in various languages, that's the sort of thing you find everywhere. But the word media, the use of journalism, is, if it's implied, it's implied very quietly, I think, in there. Um, and it's very difficult to see people opening up data with journalists in mind. Um, and yet there is stuff in there. Um, open data on the uh, lobbying interests, on the register of interests of peers and MPs staff, produced a nice story for The Guardian a couple of years ago. That's working with open data on the, on the Parliament website. Um, investigations are indeed possible. The Guardian itself is doing uh, this one, the Counted, which is people killed by the police in the US, and in fact, I, th I think I took that screen grab on Friday at 9.48. Shockingly, today I checked, it's 9.60. So without much ado in any paper, uh, 12 more people have been killed by police in the United States. Um, now that's a mixture of open data, uh, data where the, uh, the Guardian asked for people to send it in, and in a sense open data of looking at um, media stories and saying, um, you know, what can we find? Do we see a report here or we hear something on the radio? and we log it. It's a model that's been done for several years by people like um, Homicide Watch in Los Angeles. But The Guardian was noted the other day b even by the FBI saying that The Guardian's database was better than theirs. So it's sort of open data in reverse in a way. It's, it's being done by journalists and it is data which is open uh, but it's not put out there as open government data. Um, and there is a reason why I think um, journalists don't really look at open data as a potential source. Um, I've always loved this definition of news, um, particularly when I'm doing seminars on investigative journalism. Um, I think Lord Northcliffe said it in the 19th century, but I can't prove it. Um, and it's at the back of most journalists' minds is this idea um, that they ought to be doing something that somebody doesn't want them to know. So the whole idea of having open government data goes completely against that. If they want us to know it, we don't want to put it out there because they want us to know it. We want to move on and find something that somebody doesn't want us to know. That's what we do. That's what journalism's all about. Um, yes, sort of. Um, the problem is then that um, they think, well, I'll go to FOI. I'll do a freedom of information request because that's something they don't want us to know, and I'm really clever, and I'm going to find it out because I've asked the right question. It's like playing a sort of journalistic game of battleships where you say square C9, and they go, miss. Uh, and you say D4, and they say, hit. If you add open data and freedom of information, maybe you have transparency. And I think, speaking in Britain, where we have a short history, really, of transparency, um, that's particularly true. Um, there is 
some transparency out there. I did try to do a, a sort of survey of people's perception of um, corruption in a given country and their m open data readiness score and their uh, transparency score. And I tried to sort of do it mathematically and it, it didn't really work and the supervisor I had at, at Oxford wasn't at all happy with it. So I haven't reproduced it here. But it did sort of push the Swedes and the Finns and the Danes to the top uh, and, the New and the New Zealanders. Um, and Britain and America were sort of a bit lower down than their open data scores might have implied. And I think that sort of is reality, that we are um, not as transparent as we think we are or we'd like to be. Um, and as Eric Hanel said earlier from, um, from uh, 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 Tableau, he said that um, open data is out there, um, but it's not everybody can consume it in its native format. Now, what governments, including the British and the Americans, were looking for uh, was what they call the armchair auditor. Um, what Obama said during one of his town hall speeches in his first election campaign, you, c you guys, everybody, the entire population, can be our eyes and ears. They want sort of, they want, tr in return for transparency, they want auditing on the cheap, where the, the people sit in their armchair with their Excel spreadsheets and work out where the money is going where it shouldn't be. Um, Cameron, in the uh, election of, for 2010, uh, referred to armchair auditors. Um, but you can't really, as you hunt around the internet, you can't really find many of them coming out there. There are one or two. I mean, one of my favorites uh, may even be in the room. It's Tom Forth from City Metric, or I d did this for City Metric. And this, to me, the, this and the argument that goes underneath this, this headline ought to have been a game changer in the rather pathetic slanging match between G Gatwick and Heathrow um, with all the strange arguments they muster and that you have to walk past on your way through the airport telling you why their airport should be the expanded one, um, that actually we've got far more um, going on at uh, Schiphol, and actually Birmingham has got better connections um, to Europe uh, than Heathrow or Gatwick. Um, it's a very good article, well worth reading. But it didn't get replayed or picked up much in the mainstream media. And that's part of my point, that where open data is being used, it's not coming through as open data to, um, to the readers, to consumers of news. In the United States, there are uh, interesting, quite fun uh, websites like Follow the Money and Maplight. And there is a completely different, or if you like, a more developed ecosystem um, that picks up more than just journalists, more than just NGOs, but there are websites and APIs that are doing things that allow you, the citizen, to have a, a quick check on what's going on. Things like, you know, is your doctor on the take from pharmaceuticals? You use ProPublica's Dollars for Docs app. Um, finding out MapLight, which, is, which stands for Money and Politics, light, shedding light on money and politics. So looking at specific um, causes in the Senate or the House and um, seeing who's been paid what to vote which way. So being able to look up by keyword um, particular debates and see who's in the pay of whom um, for voting in a, in a given way. That exists and it's rather useful, but it's not happening in many other countries that I can see, except on rather small scales. And the other thing that's causing people to shy away, journalists to shy away from open government data, in my humble opinion, is something like that, which is that there is a confusion between data and statistics. If you put them together in people's minds, it's, oh, well, I'm going to have to do percentages, and I haven't done that since school, and, oh, it's all going to be terrible. Um, I'd rather just read a press release and turn that into a story. Um, so that's holding people back. Um, there is a journalistic role, though. There is a lot of data out there that needs interpreting, sifting, and I don't think there's an army of armchair auditors out there. I think journalists uh, need to be doing some of this stuff and using, if you like, the multiplier effect of, of mainstream media to bring things to the attention of their readers. Otherwise, what might happen is something like this. Which, this is one of my internet heroes, is uh, Tony Hurst from Open University, who does a wonderful blog, ousefulinfo um, And he, because he can, wrote some code which simply took a data set uh, and 
and wrote automatically, filled in the blanks, wrote press releases for any given county or CCG in the National Health Service um, about diabetes prescribing, and he's done several others. So you can get the journalists completely out of the equation if they don't get their act together and start understanding open data, and get an app that will write press releases, and therefore, if you like, stories, um, done entirely automatically. Presumably, they can then be read automatically as well. Um, when I was talking about my uh, working paper uh, to somebody at uh, ODI, she said, oh, you mean big data has won. And what I think she meant was that in the public imagination, there is more recognition for the words, the keywords big data, than there is for open data currently. Um, and there are all the um, missteps and misapprehensions and worries about big data, privacy, uh, and all those problems. And open data is not really uh, in there. And unlike um, Becky's mother-in-law, mother, mother-in-law test, mother-in-law test, my father test, what do I do with my time? I talk about open data, and he looks blankly at me. And he hasn't got any terrible disease. He just looks blankly at me because he doesn't know what it is that I'm doing with open data and what open data is. And he's the sort of person who's educated enough to make some use of it. He needs something like the Daily Telegraph, his paper of choice, to actually not just write using open data, but actually spell out the fact that that's where they got their stories from. Um, so going back to the question, does open data need journalism? Well, there is stories. There are stories in open data. There are leads to stories. It's not just about statistics. You can find things which will lead you to stories. This is what I tell journalists when I'm talking to them about open data. But you look at the sheer numbers of journalists that I and others train, and you think of them as part of the population of journalists worldwide, and it's still scratching the surface. Data minus openness is a bigger story than data plus openness. In other words, where governments don't release stuff, or they distort it, or they refuse to release it, or they won't release it under FOI, that's a story too. And that's not being written about very much. And there's plenty of stuff out there which is not really um, good enough. Um, if you look at Open Knowledge Foundation's uh, website, they've identified, rightly in my opinion, 10 key government data sets. So if you can't read it from back there, budgets, companies, elections, emissions, legislation, maps, postcodes, uh, spending stats, and timetables, public timetables. That should give you, for the 97 countries they're reporting on, 970 data sets. Well, 830 of them, 837 of them exist. 539 of the 837 are up to date, and 312 are mean re machine readable. Of those 312, open 106. So we're down to 11% out of the po possible population of countries which are sort of self-selecting on that list, the 97, are countries which claim to be doing stuff with open data. Uh, and I think 106 out of 970, if I scored that in a school exam, I'd expect a bollocking, wouldn't you? Um, so does open data need journalism? Well, of course the answer is yes, but it's a two-way thing. Open data, we, I, I consider myself in the middle now. I'm a, I'm a retired journalist, and I'm a dataholic and passionate open data advocate. And somewhere in the middle, the open data community needs to talk to journalists, and journalists need to understand what open data is and could do for them. And they need to publicize each other. It's, it's a two-way street, and it's not happening. Um, I noticed a tweet earlier today from a, somebody who's not here, an American journalist, said, reporting without data is a mere anecdote. Data without reporting is just as blind. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. <laughs>